Hello and may the spheres be with you. Do you want to know how these spheres are created with Blender? Or do you want to visualize complex functions on a Riemann sphere? In either case, this is the right time and the right place to be. Each of these spheres carries a label that is related to a mathematical function. But you actually don't need to know anything about these functions and you can just play with them and see what you get almost effortlessly. These spheres are created by a simple Blender add-on that was inspired by the YouTuber Lemaxium, whose work can be seen in the link shown in the upper right corner. In part 1 the add-on is introduced and explained. Secondly, we will highlight projections from the plane to the sphere in general. We start with the well-known map of our planet and extend this one to the stereographic map of the entire two-dimensional plane. Thereafter, mathematical functions are shown and extended from the regular coordinate system to the Riemann sphere. Eventually, some more in-depth Blender concepts are touched, like the usage of open shader language and shape keys. Finally, this video closes with season's greetings. The Python script for the Blender add-on can be downloaded from the link provided in the video description. It is installed as follows. Open the preferences and choose add-ons. Browse your file system for the add-on location, install it and activate it. Then it can be accessed most easily as one of the possible meshes that can be added to the scene. Once it is added, you can simply customize it. Especially all the complex functions that are available in Python libraries can be explored without limitations. After all, it's just a crunching of numbers that lies underneath. On top of the coloring, the absolute values of the functions can be presented. If the displacement slider is turned on, the spheres will be converted into white planets, where the zeros of the functions are shown as deep valleys and the poles appear to be spikes. There is one obvious limitation. The resolution of the spheres has to be defined initially and it is the same everywhere across the sphere. It would be nice if zooming in would reveal more details. There is a way to realize this in Blender with open shader language. This will be shown at the end. However, as a warning ahead, open shader language so far only works with cycle renderers and without GPU support. Therefore, it takes considerably more time to render images. To illustrate the action of the add-on, let's have a look at a more familiar example first. And let's find out how the Earth can be reconstructed from a flat map. In Blender, the standard cube is removed and replaced by a plane. In the shape editor, the material of the plane can be customized. Here an image texture is chosen and the corresponding image is loaded from the file system. The color output of the image texture is connected to the base color of the standard shader. And the resulting material can be seen in the rendered view. The background color is turned black to increase the contrast. In the edit mode, one can see that so far the mesh of the plane merely consists of four vertices, the corners of the square. This is not enough since they will be mapped to the poles only. With the loop cut tool, 25 lines are added horizontally and vertically, such that a nice mesh of vertices, edges and faces is obtained that can be transformed into a sphere. It is very likely that there is an existing Blender tool that converts these vertices of the plane into a sphere automatically. But it is instructive to do this manually, especially if you want to do animated transformations. The manual transformation of each vertex is most conveniently performed in a Python script. Having turned back to object mode, a text editor is opened and the font size is adjusted for this presentation. The standard Blender library is included. First, the projection is defined. The coordinates of the mesh are usually called u and v, and they both range from minus 1 to plus 1. Theta is the angle of latitude. It is obtained by a simple rescaling of the v coordinate to range from minus 90 to 90 degrees. Similarly, the longitude phi is obtained from u, that is rescaled from minus 180 to 180 degrees. The latitude and longitude are polar coordinates that are mapped by a standard transformation in two three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates of the embedding space. The plane is selected to be the active object. In the next step it is referenced by a variable named plane. The current positions of its vertices are captured by a shape key, also labeled with the word plane. A second shape key is added with the name sphere. 
In the last step, the coordinates of the vertices for this second shape key are calculated with the help of the protection. That's all what's needed. Now we have a set of shape keys that can be used to transform the plane into a sphere. An additional subdivision surface modifier can be used to increase the resolution. One can nicely observe how the poles get lifted up and down respectively and how the two parts of the eastern and western longitude are converted into the eastern and western hemispheres. This projection is convenient when one wants to map a finite square into a sphere. However, a Riemann sphere is a projection of an entire infinite two-dimensional plane. The corresponding projection is the stereographic projection. Geometrically, the stereographic projection can be understood in the following way. Each point of the plane is connected with the north pole of the sphere. Then the point is moved along the line of connection until it hits the surface of the sphere. The part of the plane outside of the sphere is mapped onto the northern hemisphere. And the part of the plane inside the sphere is mapped onto the southern hemisphere. The transformation has a very simple mathematical description. The north pole itself corresponds to infinity that is usually excluded from the standard domain of the function. This relation is better explored when the inverse transformation is considered. There, the circles of latitude are mapped onto concentric circles around the origin. The equator stays fixed and the north pole itself is mapped to infinity. And all the curves that go through the north pole ex extend after the projection to infinity. Although infinity is just one point in a complex plane, there are infinitely many directions from where this point can be approached from and the Riemann sphere offers a unique possibility to shine light beyond the usual horizons of finite domains. Let's now see how some well-known functions are converted into Riemann spheres in a step-by-step -step fashion. Let's start with a simple polynomial. Everyone is familiar with such a cubic polynomial. It has one real root located at 1. In the first step, this polynomial is extended to the complex plane. Each complex function maps the complex plane into another complex plane. Four dimensions would be needed to display the full information. However, complex numbers can also be represented by arrows. And eventually the direction of the arrow is color-coded and the length of the arrow is displayed as height. Therefore, the action of the function is shown as a colorful landscape on top of the complex plane. The height shows the absolute value and the color represents the face of the image point for each source point of the original plane. The function shows two more zeros in the extended plane. All the zeros appear as valleys in the landscape. For large complex numbers, the landscape steadily grows to infinity. Finally, the landscape is mapped onto the Riemann sphere. The heights are disregarded for a moment and only the faces are shown. One can clearly see that the faces rotate through all directions once around each zero and the picture completes with three rotations around the point at infinity. When the information about the absolute values is added, the sphere gets deformed into a pair-like object. A second example shows the sine function. On the real line it is periodic and the positive and negative values represent the real faces color coded in red and light blue. When extended to the complex plane, the oscillations get overexposed by an exponential growth in the imaginary direction. You first see the transformation of the grid lines followed by the transformation of the original complex plane into the image plane under the sign transformation. Again, the entire plane can be mapped onto a sphere. First only the faces are shown and eventually the information about the absolute values are turned on again. Here the complex structure of the infinite point can be guessed. It somehow has to combine the alternating finite sine function along the real line with the exponentially growing hyperbolic functions in the imaginary direction. Finally, there is the possibility to create textures of Riemann spheres directly by the shader. In this way the resolution increases on demand. However, so far this method is not supported by the GPU renderer. Rendering can only be performed on the CPU and it takes considerably longer. Nevertheless, it's worth having a look at the open shader language. We start a new project and in principle just have to open or type the open shader language script. Here initially input parameters and output parameters are defined, whose purpose will become obvious shortly. 
For the coordinate inputs, we directly take the UV coordinates of the sphere, that is, a two-dimensional rectangle ranging from 0 to 1 in each direction. These coordinates get rescaled to latitude and longitude coordinates in the line 8 and 9. The transformations in line 11 to 13 convert from longitude and latitude coordinates into Cartesian coordinates of the embedding three-dimensional space. And these coordinates are finally converted into real and imaginary parts, xi and chi, of the complex plane via the now familiar stereographic projection. In the next 10 lines, from 21 to 31, calculate the iteration for the Mandelbrot set. For each point of the complex plane, it is investigated how many iterations it takes for a given map to exceed a predefined cutoff. The number of steps it took are converted into a gray value that is the output of the script. The standard cube is replaced by a sphere and the resolution is increased for nicer images. The shader menu is opened and the texture for the sphere is created. Only a script node has to be attached. The rendering engine is set to cycles. The input values of the open shader language script appear as inputs of the node. Similar, the outputs are shown on the other side. From the texture coordinate input node, the UV coordinates are piped into the script, and the gray values are piped into the base color input of the standard shader. Immediately the Mandelbrot set appears on the sphere. The black area is the actual Mandelbrot set. It contains all points for which the iteration stays bounded. It either converges to a finite value, a so-called fixed point, or it cycles between a finite number of points. One can play with the parameters of the iteration to increase the details. The number of cycles determines how often the color cycles from black to white during the full range of iteration. You can also add a color ramp node to customize the colors of the sphere, and you can turn on emission to make it even brighter. To show that there is no limit to the resolution, one can zoom in and the following animation is the result of the simple setup. As the camera zooms in, more and more details for the texture are calculated. If you are in for a little bit of experimental stuff, let's leave the comfort zone of Blender. A subdivision modifier can be added and the resolution can be set to adaptive. In the script, there is a second output value that is largest for the black area and falls off according to the needed iterations. This output field can be connected to a displacement node and this node can be connected to the material output. In the settings for the material, the attribute displacement only is selected, which converts the sphere into a spectacular landscape, highlighting the fractal boundary between convergence and divergence. I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to almost 250 subscribers. You might think, well, that's not really a lot, but from my everyday life perspective it means a lot. Usually I teach in front of classes with about 20 students. Most of them are very polite and pretend attention. But only once in a while a few of them really engage in the presented subject. On the other hand, in these videos I can present material that I enjoy a lot and your comments indicate that some of you are really happy with it as well. This video was more or less created in response of one of your comments. Please stay engaged and let me know what you think. Bye for now and stay tuned for more.